Let's begin our worship service singing the solid rock. Please stand as we sing. stand once more as we sing Jesus paid it all.
If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to the book of Revelation this morning. Chapter 21. Someone said to me this morning, Pastor, are we in chapter 22 today? I said, no, we're still in chapter 21. We may be in chapter 21 next week as well. This is so good and so rich that I want to take my time as we finish off Revelation. And so uh, I am looking forward. I'm going to continue my message this morning. Um, a place called home. A place called home. It's hard for us to imagine heaven, isn't it? We try and we um, understand to a point. But the beauty of heaven is far beyond anything that we can put into words or describe. Uh, my friend, Pastor Chris Kendall, his daughter, his two older children have been reading through the scriptures, uh, reading through the Bible. And Brooklyn was reading through Revelation. And she come to the end of Revelation. She come to chapters 21 and 22. And uh, Pastor Chris didn't know what was going on. Brooklyn came out of her room one day just in tears. And he said, he said, honey, what's the matter? She said, nothing's the matter, daddy. She said, I was reading in Revelation and I was reading about heaven. And she said, it's just so beautiful. It is. Amen. Heaven becomes sweeter. The older we get. Y'all have to bear with me. <laughs> a little bit weak here and there. But heaven gets sweeter. With every passing day. With every passing year. And I want us to look at what we have to look forward to. Because heaven is our home. This earth we're just passing through. Amen. Amen. But heaven is our home. <laughs> Daniel Aiken. Uh, as he was writing about. Revelation chapter 21 was trying to draw an illustration of how much we don't really understand how wonderful and how beautiful heaven is going to be. And he said, think about our world. Our world has changed a lot in the last 500 years. Would you agree? My goodness, it's changed a lot in my last 59 years. But the world's changed a lot in the past 500 years. Most of us cannot really imagine how different Things were, uh, and I want to give us some interesting reminders this morning. Here's a clue of how things have uh, were back in the 1500s. You're going to get tickled at some of these. Back in the 1500s, most people got married in June because they took their yearly bath in May. <laughs> and they still smelled pretty good by June. <laughs> and did you know that the tradition of a bride carrying her bouquet of flowers, the reason was it helped to cover some of the body odor. Aren't you thankful to be living in 2023? Where's that bar of soap, Brother Larry? <laughs> Baths back then consisted of a big tub filled with hot water. The man of the house had the privilege of going first and he enjoyed the nice clean water. And then came his sons and any other men that were a part of the family. Then the women. And finally the children. Last of all, those poor babies. By then the water was so dirty that you could actually lose someone in it. Hence the saying, don't throw the baby out with the bath water. <laughs> Most houses had thatched roofs, thick straw piled high with no wood underneath, and it was the only place for animals to get warm. So all the dogs, the cats, and other small animals, mice, rats, and bugs included, lived in the roof. And when it rained, it became slippery, and sometimes the animals would slip and fall out of the roof. Hence the saying, it's raining cats and dogs. Aren't you thankful to be living in 2023? 
However, there was nothing to stop things from falling into the house. This posed a real problem in the bedroom where bugs and other droppings could really mess up your nice clean bed. I can't imagine how the bed was clean and nice when they only took the bath once a year. But <laughs> Hence a bed with big posts and a sheet hung over the top afforded some protection. And that's how canopy beds came into existence. The floor was dirt. Only the wealthy had something other than dirt. Hence the saying, dirt poor. Most people had little meat, but sometimes they would obtain pork, which made them feel special. When visitors came over, they would hang up their bacon to show, show it off. It was a sign of wealth that a man could bring home the bacon. And they would cut off a little to share with guests, and they would sit around and chew the fat. England is an old country, not very large. And they started running out of spaces to bury people. So they would dig up coffins and take the bones to a bone house and reuse the grave. When reopening these coffins, one out of 25 coffins had found, were found to have scratch marks on the inside. And they quickly began to realize that they had buried some people who were still alive. And so they began something to solve that problem, they would tie a string to the wrist of a corpse and run it, lead it through the coffin and through the ground and tie it to a bell. And someone would have to sit out in the graveyard all night, which is what came to be known as the graveyard shift, to listen for the bell. And then someone could be saved by the bell or it was considered a dead ringer. <laughs> yes, things have changed quite a bit in the last 500 years, but these changes pale in comparison, dear friend, to the way things are now and how they will be in the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. Our minds can't really comprehend it. Last week, as we looked at Revelation chapter 21 and verses one through eight, John gave us a glimpse of the glory of eternal life. We talked about it. Dr. Charles Swindoll summarized it well. He said, in heaven there's no more sea because chaos and calamity will be eradicated. There will be no more tears because hurtful memories will be replaced. There will be no more death because mortality will be swallowed up by life. No more mourning because sorrow will be completely comforted. No more crying because the sounds of weeping will be soothed. No more pain because all human suffering will be cured. No more thirst because God will graciously quench all desires. No more wickedness because all evil will be banished. No more temple because the Father and the Son are personally present. No more night. Because God's glory will give eternal life. No more closed gates. Because God's doors will always be open. No more curse. Because Christ's blood has forever lifted that curse. What a wonderful and a sweet place heaven's going to be. Today we're going to pick up in Revelation chapter 21. I'm going to start with verse 7. And we're going to go through verse 21 today. Would you pray with me? And then we'll read the scripture together. Father, today, we're so thankful for your precious word. And Lord, as we study what John the Revelator, what he saw, what he wrote, Lord, we learned about that wonderful place called heaven, our home, our forever home, our eternal home. And Father, we are so thankful. Oh, we had a precious Savior, the Lord Jesus, who died at Calvary to make it possible for us to go and the price was his own blood so that our sins could be forgiven our sins could be covered we're covered in the very righteousness of Christ so we could stand before our holy and wonderful God father thank you for the price that Jesus paid that we could have the hope of eternal life in heaven forever with you Lord today as we study this scripture I pray that 
Father, you would quicken our hearts. And Father, that we would be challenged to walk ever closer to you. Heaven's not so far away. And we've got so much to look forward to. We've got so much to do as we prepare to go. So many people to tell of the love of Christ. So many people to pray for. So many people to love. Lord, help us to, to love them even as you do in these days we live in. And Father, help us to cast our eyes upon our Savior daily, to follow him closely, and Father, to always be looking forward to heaven to come. Bless us as we go to your word now. Teach us. Lead us by your Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you will, look with me, beginning in verse 7. And we'll read through verse 21. The scripture says, He who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone which is the second death. Verse 9 says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And she had a great high wall with twelve gates and twelve angels at the gates, and names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he who taught with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. And the city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. The construction of its wall was that of was, was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, and the sixth sardius, and the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth uh, Chrysophrase, the eleventh adjacent, and the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. We're going to stop there today because there is much to talk about. But as we look at this scripture today, I want to go back to verse 7. And I want us to see a powerful promise. Look at that verse with me. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. I have circled the words he who overcomes. How many of you know God wants you to be an overcomer? This world we live in is hard. It's hard to go through. It's hard to live a Christian life. It's hard to live a righteous life in the world we live in today. But God has called us as his children, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, to be overcomers. John, who wrote this uh, book of Revelation as, as the Lord revealed it to him, uh, is believed to have been 90 years old when he penned these words. John, who was exiled on the Isle of Patmos. John, who had fought a good fight, who had, had overcome persecution. And who even now is being persecuted. He, he is an overcomer. And he has been faithful to the Lord. And John writes. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. 
And I will be his God and he shall be my son. For those who overcome, we will inherit everything that is the Lord Jesus Christ will be ours. Don't you look forward to heaven? And God himself will be, we will be his children. And so we see this powerful promise. Dear church, all our believers are called to be overcomers. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 62, Jesus said, No one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. And so when we're saved, when we're born again, when we, uh, we trust Christ as our Savior, that begins a journey. That begins a journey of following the Lord. Our, our Christian faith is not just about coming to church on Sunday, although we worship and fellowship with other believers. The Bible tells us never to forsake the assembling of ourselves, but it's also a daily walk. It's a daily relationship with the Lord. It's following him in obedience. It's learning his word and reading his word and praying. It's loving others as his word tells us to. It's repenting of any sin in our lives. And yes, it's hard to live the Christian life. I'm not going to sugarcoat it for you. It's difficult. I think of our teenagers and I look around at our young people. It's hard for them today to live for the Lord in their schools. It's hard for them. But dear young people, you listen to me. The day that you trusted Christ as your Savior, you began a journey and in a relationship. And every day you must make a choice to follow Jesus. Amen? Because the world is going to pull at you. The world is going to throw temptation at you. The world is going to do everything it can to get you to take your eyes off of Christ. Don't do it. If you're saved and born again, you have the Holy Spirit within you. And you have the word of God to guide you. You have what it takes to keep your eyes on Jesus and to keep marching forth. It's not going to be easy. But I promise you, God will greatly reward you. Amen. And so we're called to be overcomers. And it says that we shall inherit all things. Uh, Jesus said, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. In other words, once you grab a hold of that plow, you keep moving forward. It's hard work, but you keep going. And you're going to reap the benefits of that. Amen. Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, one of my favorite verses. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We're to take up our cross daily and follow him. So a powerful promise. What reward there is going to be for those who overcome. I want to be an overcomer. Does anyone here want to be an overcomer? When I stand before the Lord, I want to hear the words. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. What a day that's going to be. And so we have that powerful promise that he who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. And then there's a warning to heed. Look in verse 8. Don't miss this warning. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, I saw a, a picture of a young lady and she was holding up a sign. She was, she was in some kind of uh, demonstration and she was holding up a sign and said, basically, I don't remember the exact wording, but basically the sign said, I'm looking forward to going to hell. Her idea of hell was party, rebel, rebel, do everything you want to do, live your life your way. There's no God going to tell me what to do. That was her idea of hell. I hate to tell her, but she's going to be sadly disappointed if she ever arrives there. I pray she won't arrive. I pray her eyes will be open. I pray that there will come a day where she trusts in Christ and is saved. But God's word, John writes, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That is not popular preaching today. You don't preach about hell, fire, and brimstone. But it's there. It's in the word. Amen? 
And the Bible says that if we live unrepentant lives and we continue to go our own path in our own way, having never trusted in Christ, having never repented of our sins, that is our destiny. But I'm thankful that's not my destiny. How about you? Have you ever trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Have you ever given your life to him and repented of your sins? Today's a good day if you've not done that. So we see a powerful promise in verse 7 and a warning to heed in verse 8. Now, let's look at the following verses. Let's look at the new Jerusalem. Beginning with verse 9 and following. I'm going to move fast, so hang on. I want you to know this about heaven. Heaven will be heaven because of Jesus. Amen. Oh, we look forward to going to heaven. I look forward to seeing my loved ones who've gone before. I look forward to seeing streets of gold and gates of pearl. I look forward to the beauties of heaven. But the most wonderful thing about heaven is when I cast my eyes upon my Savior, the Lord <laughs> Jesus. He is the centerpiece of heaven. Amen. Amen. And heaven is about Jesus. We will enjoy him intimately and forever. We will also experience the many ways he showers us with blessings of grace and goodness. You know, Jesus' words, one of my favorite passes, passages is John chapter 14. I think I shared this with you last week. I, I read that verse at almost every funeral I do. Jesus gave us the promise. I go to prepare a place for you. Listen at that. That taught to send chills up your spine right now. Jesus said... I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. I love to ride around and I love to see new homes going up and being built. They make some beautiful homes today, don't they, Paige? You're in the business of helping people find their forever home here on this earth. And, and listen, they make some beautiful homes. And I tell you what, though, Brother Gene, I think a lot of days... My home in heaven is being worked on even now. Jesus gave me that promise. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm coming again. That's the best part. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. And we will be there forever with him. The city is also called a bride. And she is the most holy place as well. The new Jerusalem is a great city. It's a holy city. It's a heavenly city. It's the Lamb's city. And John details her glory. Look in verses 11 through 14. Having the glory of God, her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also, she had a great and a high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates. The name of Names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. John details the glory of this city. It is God's glory. His description is accurate, but it is also inadequate because of the limitations of human language. John tells us its radiance is like a very precious stone, like a jasper stone, bright as crystal. Uh, it is a translucent stone, perhaps opal or even a diamond, specifically associated with the light and the glory of God. The city had a high and a massive wall, a symbol of security and stability. And it has 12 gates, a sign of great access, since there are three in each direction of the compass, north, south, east, and west. At the 12 gates are 12 angels, divine honor guards. Thought about that. 12 angels, an angel posted at every gate, divine honor guards. The devil's already been dealt with. He's been put in his place. And these angels stand 
as honor guards. The gates are always open. There's never a reason to close the gates. I thought, I don't know if any of you have ever visited the White House. I had the opportunity to visit when President Clinton was in office. And when you arrive uh, and you begin to go through the door of the White House, they have Marines posted at every, at every entrance. And they stand at attention. Honor guards they are. And that's what these 12 angels are doing at the gates of heaven. They stand there. What a sight that's going to be. Each of these gates contain all the names of the 12 tribes of Israel's sons. God is faithful in his covenantal promises to Abraham and his descendants. Then verse 14 further describes the wall by noting it has 12 foundations on which are written the 12 names of the Lamb's 12 apostles. We're told in Ephesians 2.20 where Paul writes that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. Charles Swindoll notes that concerning these 12 tribes and 12 apostles, thus the city will be the dwelling place of the united people of God, Old and New Testament believers, whose salvation rests on the completed work of Christ. Isn't that beautiful? Is God's word not beautiful as it describes how wonderful heaven is going to be? The new Jerusalem is the most holy place where God is glorified. I'll tell you something else, and I get, I get excited about a few things I'm going to share with you. The angel in verse 9 measures the city with a golden measuring rod. And we find that it's laid out like a cube. That recalls and reflects the most holy place in the temple, the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies was where the priest would go in, and that's where God's presence dwelt. And if that priest had any unconfessed sin in his life, he would be struck dead in the very presence of God. But the new Jerusalem is built like the, it's in the same shape as the Holy of Holies, which signifies God's powerful presence is always there. And we're going to be there in his presence. Then in verses 18 through 21, it describes both the incredible magnificence and the incredible value of this city. You can't even put a value on it. The wall is built of jasper, and the city is being described as pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. There are 12 stones total which correspond roughly to the gems on the breastplate of the high priest. The 12 gates are 12 pearls. Each individual gate was made of a single pearl. Their value simply cannot be calculated. I love what Billy Graham's daughter, Ann Graham Lott, said about those 12 gates made of pearl. Each gate of a single pearl. You know how a pearl is made? An oyster gets... A piece of dirt or an irritant. And it begins to, to, to coat that irritant. Begins to coat that grain of sand so that it's more tolerable. And little by little over time it becomes a beautiful pearl. And that's how a pearl is made. I can't imagine the size of an oyster that made these gates a pearl. But nothing's too hard for my God. Amen. Ann Graham Lotz had an interesting insight. She said, could it be? Because a pearl represents the beauty that comes from suffering. Could it be that those gates, all made of a single pearl, will remind us, remember they're never closed those gates are always open. We're going to be able to come and go in and out through those gates. You say, Pastor, where are we going to go? Well, remember, there's a new earth. There's a new heaven. 
We're going to come and go. And she said, could it be that every time we pass through those gates and we see those gates of those single pearls, we're reminded of the great suffering and the great cost that it took the Son of God for us to be there. The beauty of heaven. There's something else that touched my heart. And I'll close with this today. Twelve gates all had a name on them. And all twelve represented the twelve tribes of Israel. God was faithful and true to his covenant promise to, to Abraham. And then... There were the 12 foundations representing the 12 apostles. And each, each layer had the name of one of the apostles. John. Ninety years old, faithful to God. Battle-worn and weary. He looks, and he looks down the names of the 12 apostles, and he sees his name, John. It's worth it all. It's worth it all. Every bit of suffering, every bit of pain, every bit of persecution in following Christ. The glory of heaven and the glory of our eternal home with our Savior is worth it all. It's worth it all. Everything you're walking through, every affliction, every suffering, every pain is light. And compared to the glories that are to come. It's going to be worth it all, dear child. It's going to be worth it all, believer. It's our forever home. It's a place called home. And it's your home. And if you don't know Christ as your Savior, it can become your home today. By believing and trusting in Jesus. To save you from your sins. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes. Today you, you may say, Pastor... I want to know, I want to have that peace. I want to know that my home is heaven and that's where I'm going. If you've never trusted in Christ, if you've never asked Him to forgive you of your sins and by faith, trusted in what He did for you at the cross, you can do it now. You can pray a prayer like this. Father, thank you for loving me so, so much that you gave Jesus your son. He died on that cross for my sins. Forgive me. I know my sins put him there. And I pray you would cleanse me. Lord Jesus, I believe. I believe in you. Save me today. Come into my life and help me to follow you. I repent of my sin. And I turn to you. Help me to follow you from this day forward. Thank you for loving me and thank you for saving me. In Jesus name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and you've never done that, then the Lord just saved your soul. You can have the peace and assurance that heaven is your home. We're going to begin to sing. Benji's going to lead us. I'm going to stand down front. Today, if you prayed that prayer and you know that Christ just saved you, rejoice in that. I'm going to ask you to have the courage to walk down the aisle and take me by the hand and say, Pastor, I just prayed that prayer with you. And I promise you, we'll rejoice. We'll encourage you.
and we'll help you grow in your faith. Don't take this time lightly. Whatever the Lord is speaking to your heart, if you feel that tug, obey Him and come.